Not too long ago, a video surfaced of an ex-pastor named Kevin Wesley who claims to have found enough evidence to make him rethink his faith in God and the Bible. In the video, he states that he can no longer go on teaching what he refers to as lies. Furthermore, he states that he has researched these things personally and his findings are what led him to his decision. In this video, I'm going to be analyzing his claims and responding to them to see just how valid they really are. They're not really valid, but keep watching. First, he says that he no longer believes the Bible is the true or infallible Word of God. He never elaborates why he believes this exactly, only that it was purely made for control. Let's take a look. If you guys don't want to rock with me anymore, then that's fine. I love you, I'll miss you, and all I can do is hope that one day you see where I'm coming from. But I will not stop posting. I will not stop teaching what I now believe, just as no one can make me stop teaching what I believed in when I believed in the Bible. Okay, I now know that without a shadow of a doubt, the Bible was manufactured for control. I understand this. You don't, and that's okay. So you have a right to be upset because you've never been told these things. I am a teacher. My job is to teach you things you don't already know. Okay then, teacher, teach me this. Who is behind the Bible that controls people? If control is being exercised, there has to be someone doing the controlling. So who is it? I'd like to know because you kind of left that part out, my friend, and it seems to be an important piece of information. Also, are all of the sacred books that were written so long ago actually written with the intention of controlling people? For example, the Quran, the Muslim holy book, or the Book of Mormon. What about the Bhagavad Gita, the Hindu scripture, or the Urantia book, which is a book of spiritual philosophy that originated in the early 20th century Chicago? I've personally heard the claim from people in the past that the Bible was invented by the government in order to control its residents. If that's the case, which government was that? Was it the Old Testament nation of Israel who persecuted and killed the prophets? when the prophets showed disobedient Israelites and kings that they weren't following the Hebrew scriptures? What about the Roman government, which existed at the time the New Testament came into being? That can't be the case because the Romans authorized the execution of Jesus Christ at the demand of the Jewish religious leaders and all Jesus did was preach the gospel and perform miracles. In addition, thousands of Christians were persecuted and killed by Rome afterwards. They were even fed to lions in Colosseums, so I never understood that claim. Do you really want to know who invented the Bible? 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. God invented the Bible. At least, He was the inspiration behind the writing of it, not some government or something like that to try and control people. And why was the Bible written? To help us get to know God identify Jesus as the Messiah, and prepare us for heaven. Saying that the Bible was invented for the purpose of control is really just an excuse for someone to reject the Bible, and not a very good one. By the way, if you're in the market for a good Bible, I recommend the Amazing Facts Prophecy Study Bible. It's a New King James Version Bible, which is easy to understand for beginners, and a reliable translation of scripture. And it has a lot of useful features, including Amazing Facts' 27 Bible study guides, an explanation of Bible numbers and symbols to help you better understand Bible prophecy, a concordance, maps, letters of Christ in red, a chronology of the Old Testament, and a harmony of the Gospels. Get yours now by clicking on the Prophecy Study Bible link, which I have included in the description box. Another claim ex-pastor Kevin Wesley makes is that none of the characters of the Bible are actually real and none of them are found anywhere throughout history. So when I tell you I believe in God, I do. But when I tell you I don't believe in the Bible or any character in the Bible, any, all of them are fake. All of them are manufactured. None of them ever existed historically. In all actuality, Many Bible characters have been historically authenticated. This includes 
King Belshazzar in Daniel chapter 5 verse 1. Belshazzar had been known only from the biblical book of Daniel and from Exonophon's Cyropedia until 1854 when references to him were found in Babylonian cuneiform inscriptions. Then there's King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Aside from the Bible, he is known from cuneiform inscriptions, later Jewish sources, and classical authors. Next, there's King Sargon of Akkad in Isaiah chapter 20 verse 1. Sargon is known from legends and tales that followed his reputation through 2,000 years of cuneiform Mesopotamian history. And there's more! King Darius of Persia, or Cyrus, who was prophesied to be the general to overthrow Babylon in Isaiah chapter 45 verses 1 through 3 before he was even born. These have both been historically authenticated along with Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor who ordered the execution of Jesus Christ. There's even evidence in support of the existence of the second king of Israel, King David. The Tel Dan Stella, and inscribed stone erected by a king of Damascus in the late 9th, early 8th centuries BCE to commemorate his victory over two enemy kings, contains the phrase Bitdwid. I may have pronounced that incorrectly, but most scholars translate this as House of David. It's likely that this is a reference to a dynasty of the Kingdom of Judah which traced its ancestry to a King David. Also the Misha Stella from Moab dating from approximately the same period may also contain the name of David in two places although this is less certain than the mention in the Tel Dan inscription. And last but not least Jesus Christ. Early non-Christian sources that attest to the historical existence of Jesus include the works of the historians Josephus and Tacitus. Josephus scholar Louis H. Feldman has stated that few have doubted the genuineness of Josephus' reference to Jesus in Book 20 of the Antiquities of the Jews, and it is disputed only by a small number of scholars. Tacitus referred to Christ and his execution by Pilate in Book 15 of his works Annals. Scholars generally consider Tacitus' reference to the execution of Jesus to be both authentic and of historical value as an independent Roman source. It is worth noting Professor Bart Ehrman of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, one of North America's leading scholars in his field, not only admits the historicity of Jesus Christ, but he calls those who deny his historicity not historians, but basically conspiracy theorists. It has been clearly demonstrated that most theological historians, Christian and even non-Christian alike, believe that Jesus really did walk the earth. So much for fictional Bible characters. But what ex-pastor Kevin Wesley said next really surprised me. I believe in what I see and what I see and what I have looked at myself and put my hands on is relics that predate Adam's existence by, by thousands of years. I've seen them myself. So you can say, well, I believe that God fashioned man from clay, and that's fine. I believe that God fashioned man from clay, just like the Bible said 7,000 years ago. Okay, well, who built the Sphinx? Because that's been here since way before Christianity, way before Adam ever existed. Now, I understand that the theory of evolution supposes life and other biological forms to be millions and billions of years old. And even though I don't agree with that because I believe faulty dating methods have been used, this includes carbon-14 dating, which is only accurate to a point, a few thousand years, and circular reasoning, which is using fossils to date rocks, and then that rock layer to date fossils found within it, with the presumption that those fossils are millions of years old to begin with, that's where I was expecting ex-pastor Kevin Wesley to go. But no, he completely surprised me with the statement that the Sphinx is older than Adam. I never heard that before, so I decided to do a little research. An article entitled, How Old Is the Sphinx? on NBCNews.com by Paige Williams states, For years, Egyptologists and archaeologists have thought the Great Sphinx of Giza to be about 4,500 years old, dating to around 2,500 BC. However, some recent studies have suggested that the Sphinx was built as long as 7,000 BC. The relatively new theory is based on what is thought to be precipitation-induced weathering on the upper areas of the Sphinx. 
Archaeologists supporting this view contend that the last time there was sufficient precipitation in the region to cause this pattern of rainfall erosion on limestone was around 9,000 years ago, 7,000 BC. This would make the Sphinx older than Adam, because Adam was believed to have been created about 6,000 years ago. More traditional Egyptologists reject this view for several reasons. First, a Sphinx built earlier than 7000 BC would upset our understanding of ancient civilization, as there is no evidence of an Egyptian civilization this old. Also, the new theory focuses only on a specific type of erosion and ignores other evidence that would support an age of 4500 years. Among these, the Sphinx is a rapidly weathering structure, appearing older than it is. Subsurface water drainage or Nile flooding could have produced the pattern of erosion. And the Sphinx is believed to resemble Khafre, the pharaoh who built one of the nearby pyramids of Giza. He lived circa 2603 to 2578 BC. In other words, to say that the Sphinx is older than Adam is highly unlikely, practically impossible even. Let's see the next clip. Listen, there's no way you're going to convince me that this God that you believe in, who inspired, so-called inspired the word of God, is okay with slavery. There's no way. When your Bible teaches you that slavery is okay, that what our ancestors went through is okay with God, then I have a problem with that. To claim that the Bible endorses the type of slavery that Africans endured is a complete show of ignorance. Exodus chapter 21 verse 16 states, And he that stealeth a man, and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. So slavery, as we think of, according to scripture, was an executable offense. Slaves in the Bible were a type of indentured servants. They usually went into servitude as a result of extreme poverty, or not being able to pay their debts. Also, it was temporary. Exodus chapter 21 verse 2 states, If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. Slaves were also granted the right to the same rest periods of non-slaves and the right to humane treatment. If a slave was mistreated, he had the privilege of being released from servitude. For example, Exodus chapter 21 verses 26 through 27 states, And if a man smite the eye of his servant, or the eye of his maid, that it perish, he shall let him go free for his eye's sake. And if he smite out his manservant's tooth, or his maidservant's tooth, he shall let him go free for his tooth's sake. In Bible times, slavery was not race-based either. So when we compare slavery in the Bible to African slavery, for instance, it's a completely different set of circumstances. Some may ask, well, why did the Bible condone any form of slavery? The answer is, slavery was not invented by God. It was already in existence and practiced by cultures surrounding the Israelites. So what God did is give his people's instructions on how to deal with it fairly. Let's continue. So when you look back and you see where this book came from, it all started 325 AD. The Council of Nicaea wrote this whole book put all these characters in it, used some uh, Egyptian type uh, theologies, not theologies, but Egyptian type um, astrology, I should call it. Philosophy, maybe? Um, to, to form the, the character of a lot of the people that's in this Bible. He claimed that the Bible wasn't written until 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea. This assertion would be obviously misguided because the Dead Sea Scrolls which are dated up to 150 years before Christ, include almost all of the books of the Old Testament, except Esther and Nehemiah. The Dead Sea Scrolls are well known to be the oldest biblical manuscripts on record. There's also a complete Greek copy of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, which was completed no later than 117 BC. That's 100 years before the birth of Jesus Christ and over 400 years before the Council of Nicaea. And the New Testament was not written by the Council of Nicaea. It already existed. Many of the early church fathers made reference to New Testament books long before the Council of Nicaea. In AD 95, Clement of Rome mentioned at least eight New Testament books. 
In AD 115, Ignatius of Antioch acknowledged about seven books. In AD 108, Polycarp, a disciple of John the Apostle, acknowledged 15 books. Later in AD 185, Irenaeus mentioned 21 books, and between AD 170 to 235, Hippolytus recognized 22 books. The first canon or compilation of books making up the Bible was the Muratorian Canon, which was compiled in AD 170. The Muratorian Canon included all of the New Testament books except Hebrews, James, and 3rd John. Not to mention, the Council of Nicaea had nothing to do with deciding what books would be a part of the Bible. It was mainly summoned to resolve arguments over the nature of the Son of God and his relationship to the Father. Arius, presbyter of Alexandria, was teaching that the divinity of God the Father was greater than Jesus Christ and that Jesus was a created being. This caused controversy in the church, and so the Council of Nicaea was summoned to resolve this. That's where the Nicene Creed comes from, which confirms the doctrine of the Trinity. Other issues which were addressed during the Council of Nicaea included the date for the celebration of Easter, the Miletian Schism, and matters of church discipline. The Council of Nicaea had nothing to do with deciding what books would belong in the Bible. As a matter of fact, when we look into early church history, there is no such council. Sure, there are regional church councils that made declarations about the canon, like Laodicea, Hippo, and Carthage, but these regional councils did not just pick books they happened to like, but affirmed books they believe had functioned as foundational documents for the Christian faith. In other words, these councils were declaring the way things had been, not the way they wanted them to be. Therefore, these councils did not create, authorize, or determine the canon. They simply were part of the process of recognizing a canon that was already there. Next clip. So it's just funny to me how, you know, we're taught all our lives that Egypt had slaves, and then we find out historically they didn't. Listen, we're being lied to. Actually, you can find plenty of evidence online, which I have done, which proves that slavery did exist in Egypt. However, it was supposedly quite rare until the New Kingdom, which started around 1550 BC. There were several causes of slavery, including indentured servitude, punishment for a crime, and captives of war. Not to mention, we have the Bible story of the Hebrews who were forced into Egyptian slavery. I think this is what ex-pastor Kevin Wesley was getting at, actually. He wants to discredit the Bible. Hard as he may try, though, there is archaeological evidence to support the biblical story of the Hebrew slaves. In the Bible, it says that they were forced to make straw bricks. And interestingly enough, an article on Aish.com entitled British Museum and Evidence of Israelite Slavery in Egypt shows artifacts that confirm that story. One of them is this mud brick made with straw. There was actually a number of these discovered, and they have a stamp, a royal seal on them, which says House of Ramses II. Not to mention the brick has been carbon dated to the Israelite period of slavery in Egypt. There were other findings too, like this staff with a cobra's head, which corroborates the story of the magicians who threw their staffs on the ground when Moses threw his staff on the ground and they became serpents. And this wicker basket pictured below, like the one which may have been used to float Moses down the Nile after he was born to save his life. Continuing on. At some point we have to use common sense that the same people who stole us from our land, raped our ancestors, hung us, why would they give us a book that would benefit us, set us free? Why would they do that? They would not. Well, they didn't. The Bible existed long before slavery was practiced in the United States, even by ex-pastor Kevin Wesley's own admission. Therefore, I don't see the logic in this argument. This is a desperate attempt to usurp and undermine the Word of God by trying to use it as a selling point to empower one ethnicity while downplaying another. The Bible truly is the greatest liberating tool known to man, as John chapter 8 verse 36 declares, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Not to mention, the Bible inspired many white Christians 
to support the abolishment of the slave trade in Britain and America by helping them to recognize that we are all equal in the sight of God. And to cast the blame on white people only for the slave trade is completely unfair because Africans sold other Africans to the Europeans. There were African middlemen and they'd fight wars with other Africans to enslave them and to sell them to the white man. Slavery was a huge business for different African kingdoms. There were pro-slavery and anti-slavery supporters among both Africans and whites. But that's a fact of history you don't hear too often. Next clip. Okay, so you say I'm not religious. Well, why do you practice Christianity? Because Jesus was a Jew. Christianity was not created until 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea, which was several years after Jesus had supposedly lived and died anyway. Jesus wouldn't even know what Christianity is. He didn't practice it. It didn't exist when he did. So why do you celebrate Christianity? As I already explained, the Council of Nicaea had nothing to do with inventing Christianity and books of the Bible had existed long before that time. As a matter of fact, the New Testament is one of the most attested ancient works of literature in history. There are almost 6,000 New Testament manuscripts with copies dating from just 100 years or so after its writing. Classical sources almost always have fewer than 20 copies each and usually date from 700 to 1400 years after the composition of the work. With so many copies and fragments of the New Testament to compare, dating back to so close to the original writings, it's easier to come up with a construction which would reflect what was in the original New Testament. In addition, how could the Council of Nicaea have convened unless Christianity hadn't already existed? I mean, it was a meeting of Christian leaders to discuss religious issues. You can't have bishops and presbyters of a religion that doesn't exist. Also about Jesus not practicing Christianity, the definition of a Christian is a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus invented Christianity. There is not only biblical, but historical evidence for this as well. To reiterate, the Roman historian Tacitus referred to Christ, his execution by Pontius Pilate, and the existence of early Christians in Rome in one page of his final work, Annals, written in AD 116. Moreover, Acts chapter 11 verse 26 says that the followers of Jesus were first called Christians in Antioch. It is clear that this ex-pastor, if that's what he really was, is confused. It's actually hard for me to believe that he was a pastor and I doubt the claim unless he bought his degree from the Universal Life Church online store for $14. Yes, you can actually buy a pastoral degree for $14 without going through any training. The danger of this, though, is you don't learn the history of Christianity, which ex-pastor Kevin Wesley seems to be completely ignorant of, even basic fundamental historical truths. Not only that, the Bible warns us that there would be people who would depart from the faith. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 states, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I don't know about you, but I consider racial division, which seems to be what this ex-pastor is promoting now, a doctrine of devils. Acts chapter 10 verse 31 tells us that God is no respecter of persons. In other words, he does not show favoritism to any race or class of people. He wants all of us to be saved and united in Christ. Another scripture which talks about people departing from the faith is 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 3 through 4, which states, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Here it talks about a class of people which are not satisfied with what the Bible teaches, so they find other teachers which give them what they want. And if you don't want to accept the authority of God, or you want special recognition for yourself or your race, and you want to feel empowered and more entitled than those around you, Satan has a deception suited to your needs and agents who will deliver it. Regardless, we should pray earnestly for this individual and any others in similar situations they may simply be confused 
in need of spiritual guidance themselves or were never truly sincere about their faith to begin with. And don't forget Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 which says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? This is why we cannot trust our feelings because our hearts can be deceived. This is why scripture urges us in Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 through 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lead not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. Without divine guidance, we will end up confused and lost. And sadly, if we turn away from God's truth after we have accepted it, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 21 warns, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than, after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. God's word is the only thing left on this earth we can absolutely trust in. But if we don't want to accept God's word for whatever reason, the devil will give us plenty of reasons to doubt it, even if they're not true or logical. However, to our deceived hearts, that is all the evidence we will need. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to like it and share it. Subscribe if you're new and click on the notifications icon next to the subscribe button so you don't miss any of my future uploads. Also, please pray that my ministry will continue growing and reaching people for Christ. And if you'd like to support my channel and ministry with a donation, links to my PayPal and Patreon accounts are available in the description box. Your donations really help. And check out some more of my videos by clicking on the screen. I have a lot of good Christian videos which I'm sure you'll enjoy if you liked this one. God bless you.